Rabbi Manus Friedman, thank God it's Tuesday. Uh, so wonderful to see you. And um, the question that I just voiced to our listeners is there's so much, thank God, there's so much good information on the internet. And if anybody wants to know about um, Torah, God, Judaism, there are so many rabbis that are so willing to spend their time and give that information over there. But however, people are not very learned and um, a lot of people are studying from scratch. And there is a lot of misinformation on this particular topic in the internet as well. So I think it's a very, very important question to answer to the people, to let the people know how to filter that information, how to tell the right information from the wrong information and the sources, of course, how do we sort filter the sources that are giving us this information? You don't want people's personal uh, character to influence the news or or Judaism. So if you're listening to someone and their character is coming across rather than the information, in other words, their their personality overwhelms the message, then you have to be careful. Then it's like you like the person or you don't like the person. That That's what it's asking for. So when a person puts his personality on, on the screen, he's not asking you to agree or disagree. He's asking you to like him or hate him. It's a very different appeal. And then you, you end up either loving him or hating him. Because that's what he's asking for, she's asking for. So when somebody's personality dominates, the subject, the topic, the discussion, not important. It's submerged by the personality. The other thing is, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if something doesn't sound right to you, then it doesn't matter who is saying it, you have to think twice. Because the Torah should sound comfortable to you. If it's Torah, if it's the truth, and it's your Torah, the one that you received at Mount Sinai, the one that your soul heard, it should feel familiar and it should feel comfortable. Maybe not easy. Easy is not even a virtue. But it's it shouldn't feel objectionable. So if something is disturbing you about what you're hearing, be careful and think twice. Re-examine. So trust your instinct to tell you when something is a little off. So think about it. You may be right, you may be wrong, but it certainly needs investigation. The point is, education is not indoctrination. So if you don't really understand it and you don't really appreciate it and it doesn't speak to you, then that's not, that's not called learning. To learn means you hear it, you absorb it, you digest it, and it sits well with you. That's called educated. Rabbi Friedman, but, uh, how come some people can relate to certain teachers and then uh, even getting the same information, but from some other teachers, it feels a little better? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, one, one person cannot be everybody's teacher unless it's Moshiach himself. The greatest feature of Moshiach is that he will be able to address everybody not by speaking in generalities but somehow supernaturally almost 
he will he will appeal to everyone's intelligence and everyone's thinking and everyone's uh, intuitive. So there are people who thrive on simplicity, and sometimes people say, "Well, well, you want all the simple answers." Yes, some people are simple. This is not a criticism. It's a personality type. They're simple. They don't like complication. They don't like they don't like overly sophisticated things. They want to keep things earthy, simple, and true. Simple is closer to true. And that's fine. That's wonderful. And there are those teachers or those rabbis or those um, educators who, who, who are that way. And so certain people will thrive from their teaching. Other people are more philosophical. They want to know the why, the how come. Some people are more skeptical. They want to know, how do you know that? Why do you say that? What about every, you know? That, that's how they learn, and that's fine too. And that's why even Moshe had to appoint 70 elders, every one of them different from the other, so that there were 70 languages in which Torah was being taught. Not, not literal languages, but... You know, like the five love languages. <laughs> <laughs> so Torah needs 70 love languages for 70 different types of, of minds, of hearts, of people. And the, and the internet can handle more than 70. There are more than 70. The question is only, is it the real thing? Is it the real thing? Or is it a personality cult? No. That's the scary part, because a lot of the people uh, will tune in or search without knowing absolutely anything. And they will not know if it's a personality or is it um, the real deal. Um, so it's very, very hard to filter. Yeah, yeah. That's what we have intelligence for. Unfortunately, we need to be intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only that weren't necessary, things would be so much simpler. But I had a teacher who was really a great, a great person, a great individual. The way he taught was so different because most people think this way and teach this way. You start with a thought, an idea. You develop the idea until you come to a conclusion. But this teacher did the opposite. First, he gave us the conclusion and then filled in the details. There's a certain drama to that approach. It's more like, let's get to the truth instead of let me convince you. If I start with the ideas and I build them, like, uh, you know, there has to be a creator because where did everything come from? So let's pursue that. That's very neutral and safe and everybody can, can follow. Then you come to a conclusion and people say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to come to that conclusion. Or, you start with the conclusion. You start with the conclusion, I am here to fulfill the mitzvahs of the Torah. That's it, no surprises. That's what I'm going to tell you by the end of this conversation. That, that's the point I'm going to, if you're not interested, you can quit now. And, and some people will quit. But you see, that approach is like saying, we need to get to the truth. Not, I'm going to try to convince you of something. If we need to get to the truth, I'm going to tell you which truth I'm headed for. 
I tell you where I want to end up. Then we can talk about how to get there. What's the logic that leads there? What's the basis for it? And, and, you, and you make a, a complete uh, concept or philosophy to support the truth that you've already established. See, that, then, then there's no gimmicks. So if you start off by saying, the world is coming to an end. It's going to be over soon. Let me explain this. Okay, I'm tuning out. <laughs> because what you're trying to lead me to, I don't want to go there. I'm not interested. So if a person were to say, every sinner will suffer punishment. You want to talk about it? No. <laughs> not particularly. You woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something? What, what is wrong with you? Why would you want to talk about how everybody's going to suffer? So if that's the conclusion, I don't want to take the trip. Wow, so, amazing time saver. <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, but how come there are so many different interpretations from reliable sources? about um, a single topic of the Torah, any topic of the Torah. For instance, uh, last week when it was the Parsha about, well, one of the um, main things that we spoke about is how the spies did not want to enter the land of Israel and for various reasons. And I think everybody in um, our synagogue uh, who studied it from a different source, a very reliable, a reputable source, had an absolutely different take on it. Um, is that healthy in our times? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not asking if it's right or wrong, but is it healthy? Because it makes a lot of people question, well, how come you have this perspective and this person has this perspective? Why are there so many perspective, perspectives in the, um, in the Torah, in understanding the Torah? There's, there's something very good about that. Uh, Torah is infinite. The question again, your original question is, of all the uh, takes, which ones are real and which ones are just somebody's personality dictating their thinking? To, to some degree, a person who has a single a single message, you know, a one a one track mind, it starts to sound like that's just his personality. There was a show on on public on public television where they studied the the texts of the of the Torah. It was not Jewish; it was the Bible, and they were studying the story of Adam and Eve. And there were five participants. They all came up with different interpretations. And this is not rabbis, this is just people. And then they studied the story of the Akedah. Each one came up with a different take, but it was the same theme for each of them. Like, for example, the feminist in the group, when they studied the story of Adam and Eve, Oh, sure. Blame the woman. Always the woman. They're always getting blamed. <laughs> <laughs> and then they read the Akedah. And what? The mother didn't get, has no say in the matter? God tells Avram to sacrifice his son and the, and the mother has no opinion? So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening is they're not asking themselves, what is the story trying to say? Somebody wrote the Torah, right? The author is trying to say something. Are you interested in understanding what the author is trying to say? Or are you just having a, a trigger reaction on your favorite topic? So you're not hearing anything at all. You might as well not have a Bible because you're already a feminist and all you're going to see in the Torah is feminism. So. 
So if if there's a one track mind, then yeah, it's not the Torah speaking. It's the personality of the individual. But the fact that there are so many different interpretations, that's that's that is the beauty of Torah. God spoke and everybody heard something divine and yet not the same. Because divinity comes in infinite forms. That's that's what we mean. God is infinite. And by the way, what was the story of the spies, as long as we're on that topic? The main question is, what is the Torah trying to tell us? Not, not how do you feel or what do you think? What is the, tr the Torah trying to tell us? If you do, if you think that way, then the first most important consideration is the context. If you're just reacting, you're being triggered, then the context is not important to you. You heard a word, that word upsets you, and you go off onto your tangent. What's the, what's the context? The big picture. The Jews were slaves in Egypt. They were taken out of slavery. Now they're free. What happens next? They're given a set of rules to live by. That's a, that's a context. You don't just go off into freedom where you can do whatever you want. Because that's not freedom. That's anarchy. Anarchy is the opposite of freedom. It's worse than communism. Because communism means somebody is in charge. Somebody has a little independence. Of course, all the wrong people. <laughs> but in anarchy... No one has anything. Everyone oppresses everyone. That's not freedom. So the next thing that has to happen when you're taken out of slavery is you need to be given uh, parameters for living. So what are you going to do all day now that you're free? So now what is your purpose? In many cases, people who were set free from slavery couldn't handle it because they no longer had a definition for their lives. They knew that they were slaves and that they had certain jobs. Now they don't know who they are or what they are. And so they deteriorate worse than slavery. So God immediately gives us the most incredible mission and includes us in his vast eternal plan so that we are not wandering around the desert wondering what to do. That makes sense. So now food is coming from heaven, water is coming from a rock, God speaks to them from heaven, very mystical spiritual life. Now it's time to go into the land of Israel. The land of Israel is going to be captured by a war, which means now you've got to be soldiers. And when you win the war, you're going to have to become farmers. You're going to have to run a country, build an infrastructure. You're going to have to get your hands dirty and be earthy and not live on miracles. That's a shock to the system. So Moshe says, you know what? Let's send spies. It's not a mystical thing. It's not even a holy thing. God did not say to do it. Let's do this on our own. Let's start taking responsibility. So they send spies. The spies come back and say, you can't, can't do it. Can't do it. The, the, the switch from a mystical, detached life into daily 
physical activity, can't do it. Too big a jump. The gap is too big. So they spent 40 more years in the desert. What is the point of the story? The point of the story is Moshe was not wrong in sending the spies, even though it was a disaster. But the disaster is an expected issue, an expected problem. How do you go from a spiritual, mystical experience to living your everyday life with purpose? Finding purpose in, in, in plowing the fields, in harvesting, in, in, in baking, cooking, grinding, building. How do you find meaning in that? It can't happen overnight. So what was the spies? It was like putting your toe into the cold water. Get, get your feet wet. Get a little experience. So they went, they looked, and they saw. It's a land of milk and honey. The, the fruits there are huge and big. The cities are great. and We can't do it. But you see, they got their feet wet. They got a taste. 40 years later, they were able to do it. So was it sad that they couldn't do it immediately? Yes. But that's human nature. They were not evil people. They had just come out of Egypt with 10 plagues. They had just crossed a sea miraculously. And all of a sudden, they're evil and come on. Keep things in context. Like the feminist who says, oh, sure, blame, blame Chava for everything. You're out of context. There were no gender issues at the time. <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, but then this is exactly my point. And so many different people listen to so many different lectures from so many different rabbis on this topic alone. And on uh, Shabbos, on Saturday at our synagogue, I heard, so the spies was about pride. Uh, they didn't want to change their status. So the spies were about lack of faith. They, they did not believe that they'll be able to win over the giants. They didn't believe enough in God. Uh, the spies um, said bad things about the land of Israel, about God's gift to, to the Jewish people. So there were so many different takes on this just one particular um, element of Torah, very important element of Torah. It's, everything is important, of course, when it comes to Torah. But is it healthy to have all these takes from, and, the, and they come from very reputable, very learned rabbis, that is it, is it wrong to have uh, a conclusion at the end of the story that pretty much, you didn't give us a conclusion just now, you gave us the scenario, but uh, pretty much everybody tries to have a conclusion at the end of the scenario. This is really, really important. If you're going to study Torah, you got to know what you're studying. This is not Shakespeare. So again, put it in context. They stood at Mount Sinai and God spoke to them. You can't, you can't ignore that a, a page later. So don't think what you would feel or what you would do. What would people who just heard God speak, how would they behave? Keep it in context. We're talking about them, not about you. And they were different. They had just had a very unusual experience. Stick to the storyline. What do people who hear God speak, what do they do next? Aren't you interested in following the story? No, you want to talk about your pet peeve. <laughs> Don't do that. Because then you've stopped studying Torah. You're just writing your own. But there is a legitimate and very necessary desire to draw a lesson. 
Okay, I wasn't there at Mount Sinai. So in some way, I can't really relate. Yeah, what would people do after hearing God speak? Go home and cheat each other? That can't be. It's not logical, it's not sensible, and it's not what the Torah is telling us. The Torah is not telling you that there were a bunch of people back then who were selfish and prideful and arrogant and stubborn. That, that's just gossip. Why do you need to know that they were bad? But if you're going to improve your own behavior, your own morality, you want to extract a lesson don't say those people were, were selfish. Those people were very different from you. They had just heard God. Come on. Yeah, but I didn't hear God. So what am I supposed to make of the story concerning my reality? So it is a good idea to say, you know what that makes me think? Makes me think that I should be careful not to be arrogant. Wonderful. Wonderful. Just don't say that that's the story. That's the lesson you extracted from the story. But when you turn it into a commentary on the Torah, no, don't do that. Let the Torah tell you what it's saying. Don't tell the Torah what it's saying. So, in the context of people who were just liberated by miracles, taken to God, God said, come, I need you, be my slave, not Pharaoh's slave. Such people, what would they do? What would they say? And why would they rebel? And come on, keep it in context. Because otherwise, it sounds really schizophrenic. One day they pass out, overwhelmed by God's presence and by God's word. The next day they tell God to bug off. Come, come on, what are you doing? What kind of weird story is that? So study the Torah and let Torah tell you. Don't dictate to the Torah what it must mean. So, Reverend Friedman, is it safe to say that... Um even the rabbis give a listen, lesson, and it's possibly a personal lesson. Um, that it, it's it's exaggerating a little bit. It's like saying Yaakov showed favoritism to Joseph, made him a coat that nobody else had, and all the brothers were jealous and wanted to kill him. Excuse me, who are we talking about? <laughs> I'm not talking about you. <laughs> if you think, yeah, sure. Yeah, my father gave my brother a coat, I'd kill him. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Who are we talking about? We're talking about Yaakov's children, the heads of the tribes of Israel who God counted by name over and over again because they were so precious to him. And they're going to kill their brother over a coat? You're out of context. Robert Friedman, but everybody is doing it. Absolutely everybody. Right. So this is the problem. You took it. You, you took the lesson that speaks to you and made it sound like that's what was happening to them. That's, that's not nice. Don't impose your weaknesses on, on people who don't have those weaknesses. So, yes, again, what lesson can we take from this week's Parsha? Any lesson you take that makes you a better person? Fine. But don't make it sound like you know those people and that's what they were thinking and that's what they were feeling. 
Rebel Friedman, but is it the point to walk away with a lesson from every everything you learn, everything you read in the Torah? Yeah. That's that's called maturing and growing and because otherwise we could we could take the opposite approach. Those people who knows what they were thinking. I mean, after you hear God speak to you, you're never going to be the same. Then they're not normal people anymore. So sure, if I was there, I would probably do the same thing. But I can't relate to them. They were they were holy people. What about, you know what what could they possibly tell me about my life, which is so different from theirs? So now all of a sudden the whole Torah is irrelevant. Well, good for them. They spoke to God. I didn't. So what are you telling me? So these are the two extremes. Sometimes, you know, people say, why, why was Avraham ready to kill his child? Well, you know, in those days, that's <laughs> what people, that you, of course, today, nobody would do that. But in those days, people actually believed in sacrificing their children. So, oh, so all of a sudden, you're, you're thinking context. In those days, at that time, under those circumstances, people were weird, not like us, but only in the negative. <laughs> they, they were primitive, they were, they were violent, they were petty. How about they were holy, they were innocent, they had incredible experiences with God. Isn't that part of the context? So the next day they turn around and say, yeah, but where's the meat? I want meat. What, who, who are you talking about here? Were our ancestors that crazy? Like bipolar? Highs and lows from one day to the next? That's a crazy story. So work out the context if you want to understand what the Torah is saying. Rabbi Friedman, but who is teaching the context without deriving lessons? Just the context. Oh, I'm not sure you have to pick one or the other. Just be careful on how you present it. Here's what they experienced. Now what we can learn from that, so you get both. Doesn't have to be one or the other. A, a good example is Korach. Korach is from the tribe of Levi. He was given a special job in the in the in the temple, but he was not a Kohen. And he got very jealous of his cousin, Aaron who was the high Kohen, the high priest, and he rebelled. Why can't I be the Kohen? So we're told that he was a very smart man, he was a very pious man, a very holy man, and a very rich man. Why was he not content? Well, you know, his arrogance, his ego, I don't need a story about a guy with an ego from 4,000 years ago. I can tell you some people with an ego right next door to me. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so it, it's out of context. That makes no sense. So what does the Rebbe say? The Rebbe says we are being told something appropriate for people like Korach at the time. There was something that the priest, the high coat, the Kayan Godel, the high priest, experienced that nobody else, nobody else. He went into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur. Going into the Holy of Holies, what is that experience? 
Korach was a holy man, and all he wanted was holiness. All he wanted was greater closeness to God. And knowing that the Kayan Godel has a closeness with God that nobody else has, he, he, he wanted it. Not he wanted the, the, the pride or the arrogance of the position. He wanted the experience that only a Kayan Godel can have. Is that wrong? So the Rebbe surprised us. It was like an original. He said, no, that's not wrong. Everyone should want to be a Kayan Godel. If you don't want to be a Kayan Godel, there's, there's something lacking in you. So what was Korach's mistake? He wanted it so badly, he thought he could actually get it. So now what is the lesson? If you know you can't get it, then ignore it. Go do something else. So the Torah is telling us, no. Even if you know you can't get it, and you're clear about that, you should still want it. Because what you yearn for is as important as what you get. So even something you'll never have, you should be yearning for. Because it elevates you. What you yearn, if you yearn for something great and holy, it elevates you in, in the godliness that you are capable of. <clears throat> so, Torah is expecting that a man like Korah, knowledgeable, holy, great, the best of the best, he was supposed to figure this out. But in his mind, it was, who doesn't want to be a Kayin Gadol? You're supposed to want. So why don't I go get it? He was supposed to figure out that you have to want it with all your heart and know that you cannot get it. So now all of a sudden we're being taught a divine lesson not a psychological evaluation of a man's ego. That's context. So the point of it is, is there value in desiring something that you can't get? Is what you desire also a reality? Yes. And that's why a person whose heart's in the right place, even if he's doing all the wrong things, you don't ignore it. Don't minimize it. If his heart's in the right place, there is something very positive about that. Very <sighs> Friedman, thank you so much. Can't thank you enough for this positivity, for this wisdom, for this insight that we seem to get only from you <laughs> these days. <laughs> if you ask, you get. Yes. <laughs> And we certainly ask. Thank you so much. And um, have a wonderful week. And I look forward to a, a lot more next week, hopefully. And a lot more good news, I hope so as well. Yes, only good news. Only good news. Amen. Thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. Speaking of good news, there's a wonderful retreat coming up, the National Jewish Retreat, run by the JLI, Jewish Learning Institute, it's going to be August 9th through the 14th in the Miami area, in a five-star hotel, best speakers, best lectures, best classes, best accommodations, and best food. So if you have those five days free or any one of those five days free, think about joining us. It's going to be great for body and soul. And there's actually a discount if you Put my initials in there, RMF. There's a little discount for those who are already committed, already studying, already interested. Google it, look it up, Jewish Retreat, JLI. And uh, hopefully we'll see you there.